Hey, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Secrets to Real Estate Investing. I'm really excited to have with us today a gentleman from the opposite side of the country from me. Um, I'm in California and he's over in Nashville. And I came across him um, several years ago at um, one of Justin Williams house flipping events. And I was so impressed with him and I've followed him a little bit, but I'm really excited to hear more about his path because he is He's done amazing things and he's had big challenges in his life too. But I wanted to um, give you a little background on him first. His name's Bill Allen. He's a Navy pilot who fell into real estate investing due to his constant military moves. He's moved 13 times in his 15 year Navy career so far. He got his start in real estate investing as an accidental landlord in 2007 when he went on deployment and started renting out his condo in San Diego, California. That continued in 2011 when he had to leave his primary residence in Pensacola, Florida and move overseas for the military. When he got back to the US, he was getting married and wanted to figure out a way to fully retire in his early 40s. Bill started buying rental houses and quickly realized that he was running out of money to build enough passive income to fully retire on. That's when he turned to house flipping to build the capital required to buy more rentals. Bill started a company called Blackjack Real Estate in 2015, and he's slowly grown that company. Well, I wouldn't say slowly, I'm gonna say quickly grown that company from doing one flip a year to 200 per year. The company started in Pensacola, Florida, but over time he's expanded to Chattanooga and Nashville, Tennessee as well. They've now flipped and wholesaled over 500 houses and continue to help homeowners and investors daily. So with that, welcome to the show, Bill Allen. Thanks, Holly. Uh, happy to be here with you. Well, thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to share some of your knowledge and expertise with those of us that have not gotten to that point of flipping 200 houses a year. That's really impressive. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background, any holes um, in the story that I missed, and give us that. Yeah, no, um, I think we moved like 16 times now. So I probably need to update that. We actually just moved like a month ago, two miles down the road. So it's been, uh, I'm, I'm a professional mover at this point. Um, have no problem moving in in the house, houses, but my wife hates it. So I know we have two <laughs> little kids uh, running around. So we've piled on a lot more stuff. So it's a lot more work for me to do those moves. So um, what are the ages of your kids? Uh, we have a four-year-old. He's almost five. He'll be five in June, so just a couple months away. And then uh, we have a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old. Wow. Yeah. Yes, your all wife boys. is busy. <laughs> yeah, all boys. It's pretty crazy in my house right now. So. Oh, man. So are there going to be more, or is that it? <laughs> uh, it depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> there's, all, there's still the potential, but uh, I'm not sure that, that I'm ready to have other babies. My wife loves babies, and I, I really enjoy uh, having our, our four-year-old where he is in his life right now. Um, I was just coaching his soccer practice last night, and I, uh, it's just a lot of fun to see him grow up and uh, start having his own opinions and things like that. Well, I'm glad you still think that's fun. Yeah, when they have their own opinions and they get all sassy and tell you what's what, that's not always so fun. Yeah, I have four kids, but they're all older now so um, yeah it's been a long time since i was in your shoes but i remember and i want your wife to get that girl so there's a little balance to all that high testosterone running around in your house <laughs> yeah well we talk about that and uh it that was that's probably the reason why we would consider trying again but i i had a lady that worked for me had six boys and uh she had six boys and one girl and she adopted the girl so six ah. boys in a row she had so um oh fun yeah I, I'm not sure I can I can put up with six boys. Uh, I'm just trying to get that girl. Well, let's um, bring it back over to real estate, even though I love kids and could talk about them all day. Uh, different show. Anyway, so tell us a little bit more about your venturing into real estate, and are you still actively, um, are you employed by the military or not at this point? Yeah, so um, I started the business when I was active duty, and I was full. So uh, I had that as a W2. And I was able to kind of grow my business and put a lot of the, um, I think it was advantageous for me. I was able to put a lot of the money that I was making back into the business to help grow it. So you said, I think the bio said slowly, you said quickly. Um, it's probably somewhere in between. You know, when you look from the outside, you think it happens really fast. When you're in the moment, you think it's taken forever. And uh, so when I look back, I try to remember 
that that growth. And I think we I think we uh, grew responsibly, but it was somewhat quick. So um, yeah, I'm still I still am uh, employed by the Navy. Um, I'm, I'm a reservist now, so I got out of active duty. I left. Um, to go full-time real estate about a year and a half ago. And uh, so now I'm a reservist. I, I go from Nashville down to Pensacola, Florida to fly with the reserves and I have to work 60 days a year. Um, okay. So the rest of the time we're, uh, you know, running the company and managing that. So um, mostly uh, pretty much 100% of my income uh, comes from real estate other than that, those few days that I fly for the Navy. Hmm, okay, interesting. So why don't you tell us about your very first deal? Okay, my first deal. Um, so I was buying rental properties at that time, and I thought that was the, the way that I was going to get. I was always a, an investor in the stock market when I was younger. I would save money, invest in stocks, and I started dabbling in real estate, buying rentals. And um, I actually bought this house thinking it was going to be a rental. Um, and I, I raised some money from some family and friends, um, and I bought it from an auction company. I, I forget what it, I forget what the old name of this auction company was, but it's, I think it's XOME now, X-O-M-E dot com. Um, so before that, it, it had another name that I, that I bought it from. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was working with a realtor and she said, hey, I found this, this property. I said, okay, great. Let's try to buy it. So we tried to go, we got, she showed it to me. I tried to make an offer. The agent wouldn't take it. She said, you have to go through this auction company. Didn't know anything about it. We put an offer in on, I just submitted an offer on the auction company and they took it. Um, when I bought the house, I went in to, um, to do some work and there was about three feet of water in the basement. After, this was in Maryland. So I was, wow. at Pax, I was in Patuxent River, Maryland at the uh, Navy base there. And I was planning on fixing this up and making it a rental. I was going to, you know, do a cash out refinance and, um, and just rent it. And so we fixed it up. Um, we pumped the water out of the basement. We got it waterproofed, figured out it was a bad sump pump combined with a couple other things. And um, put a, we put like $35,000 into it. And then the realtor said, hey, you should, should consider selling this. Like any good realtor, she wants to make another commission, right? So she said, um, you should consider selling this. I think you can make some good money. And I said, okay, let's tell me what you think we could sell it for. And um, so we ended up listing it instead of renting it and we sold it and made about $45,000. And that was kind of, that was my first flip. Um, buying from auction, a lot of things went wrong. We found some termite damage we didn't know was there. All these different things were happening, but it turned out to be an incredible deal and kind of got me hooked on uh, flipping houses from there because I hadn't really made $45,000 like that ever before, right? So Yeah, how long did that deal take from start to finish? It probably took about five or six months. Um, I was kind of, uh, had a general contractor that came in and, and did some of the work for me. And then we subbed some of the other things out to try to save some money. I was really there. I was there a lot. I put in a lot of my time trying to figure out, um, what I was doing. So, um, yeah, it's probably about five or six months. Okay. Interesting. And that's what a lot of our flips take these days here in Southern California. I know plenty of people like to wish that they can do it in a few weeks. And I bet you can do it in a few weeks now with your systems you've got, but five to six months might be realistic for a heavy rehab house for new people. Yeah. I think that house should probably take me about two to two and a half months now. Um, we didn't do so much stuff that um, it was just, I was trying to, it's funny because you try to save money when you get going, you do some of the work yourself and it turns out you're just extending the timeline, more holding costs, more carrying costs. Uh, you're not thinking about paying yourself for the labor and all of that. You end up making it the same or less money than if you just hired it out and did it right. So, yeah. Well, very interesting. So you were working for the Navy full time and doing this on the side when you started, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and tell me more about how that went. Was that okay? Was it hard? Was it great to know you had that income? Yeah, it was hard. Um, at that time, I, it, was, it wasn't that bad. Uh, it was kind of like nights, weekends, I would go over there. But when I really, I think the, the major challenge that I faced w doing both was when I started my business. So that was just kind of this, hey, this is Bill Allen flipping a house on his own. And when I really wanted to, to grow a company and, and start something, that's, that's really where it took a toll on me. Because we moved to Pensacola and, um, and the thing that people don't see, they see that you grow really fast, but they don't see all the work that you put in. So um, what I was doing is my typical day around then was um, I would wake up about five o'clock in the morning 
four thirty, five o'clock, five thirty, right around there, somewhere in that window. And before anybody in my house got up, and we just had our first baby at that time, so it was me and my wife in the house, um, and then our son, and he was probably six months old. And so he w- he would wake up around seven o'clock. So from four thirty or five till seven, I would work. So I. I'd, you know, catch up on what I missed the day before. I'd follow up on some leads, um, not calling people, obviously, but just working with my assistant. I had one person that was working for me and she was making all the calls and setting me up for appointments, but I would do all my pre-work. I'd get prepared for the day. Uh, I'd just check all these things off my task list. And then seven o'clock, my family got up, we'd have breakfast and then I'd go to work all day. So usually from eight to like six, I was flying uh, for the Navy all day. And uh, then I would come home and I'd always have family uh, dinner with my family, give my son a bath, and I'd be back in my office three hours at the end of the day. Um, and when the phone rang and we were at dinner and um, I, some, somebody was calling about a house I needed to go see, I would just get up and leave. I told my wife, this is going to probably be a year of me working really hard um, to get this business going uh, to where we want it to be. And then in the future, um, when our kids start remembering what it's like, you know, you're four, four years old, five years old, dad's going to be home all the time. So that was my goal. And uh, it was probably about, you know, a year of that, of just burning the candle at both ends to make sure that um, I could, you know, start and grow a business. So um, that's what it was like, uh, flying for the Navy. If it, if it rains, we can cancel flights and sometimes I can get some work done. Um, but typically it was, it was, you know, eight, 10 hours a day of flying for them and then uh, probably another four or five a day working for in the company. So. Wow, you had quite the drive. It reminds me of a quote. I don't know who said it. Maybe you know who did, but you were willing to do what others weren't so that eventually you could have what others wouldn't have. So That's right. Put in that work. And your wife, I mean, she had to sacrifice the time with you. I mean, I'm sure she loved you and loved spending time with you. And it's hard um, to give that time up and sacrifice that. But she had the vision along with you that it would be worth it in the end, huh? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we had to have that conversation. That's a, something I said, hey, you know, this is, where, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. Are you okay with that? And can you get on board with that? And I don't know. Now I'm home all the time. I'm in my home office right now, and she probably is sick of me being home uh, now. So. Uh, oh, I'm sure she's not. I'm sure she likes knowing that you're there. So. Yeah, I'm going to make sure she listens to this. Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, also, if I remember correctly, did you have a child with some medical issues and would you mind talking about that and how that impacted, you know, your lives and your business and all of that? Yeah, absolutely. So we did, this is our our second son. His name's James. So he was born, um, let's see, we found out, uh, my wife was about halfway through her term of her pregnancy when we found out that he had a, a heart defect. So he has, uh, he was hypoplastic right, uh, right heart. So it means uh, the right side of his heart didn't develop um, like uh, um, a heart should. So he only had basically half a heart. So as he was getting uh, older, uh, you know, uh, closer to being, uh, being born, we were trying to figure out um, what to do, what, what that was going to be like. And um, we, uh, we, did, we picked a, a hospital in Nashville because we, we were living in Pensacola at the time and they didn't have any... Uh, pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons there. So we were going to have to travel after birth to get this surgery. You know, we knew he needed some open heart surgeries. So we ended up, uh, and we were talking about this before the show, we just dropped everything. And in a couple days, we bought a house here in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, moved. We packed up all of our stuff and just moved. The Navy was really great with me, uh, letting me come up here, uh, move my family up here and get what we needed, take some time off. And um, so it was really nice to have real estate, you know, be in that world because it allowed me to do things that probably other people would have no idea how to do, like buy a house in five days and put some cash together to buy it and, and just move everything and, and pick up for your family. So it allowed me that flexibility and the Navy being as gracious as they were and my command were, were fantastic, um, allowing me to move up here and, and run a company virtually. So at that point we had about four or five people in the company and, um, and they took care of business down in Pensacola. We were just in Pensacola at the time. Um, we were doing some pretty good volume. Uh, the, the year before that, we did about almost 70 houses that year um, where we flipped about, I think we flipped uh, about 15 of those and the other you know, 55 were uh, wholesale deals. So um, I had a company that I needed to be the owner of, but I was in the hospital all the time with my family. So James was born um, and he's, he had four open heart surgeries in the first six months of his life. And, um, 
it was, yeah, we thought we were going to lose him a couple times. He's just such a powerful kid. Um, he never cries. He's all, well, he cries a little bit now, but when he was younger, he just like never cried. He was always so happy. And I really think that just, we cried enough for James. That's what I always said is, um, it was just really tough on us. But what it, what it allowed me to do in the business is, you know, having a business like this allowed me to do the things that I needed to do to take care of my family. So I was really fortunate to be able to start that uh, ahead of time so we could have the ability to be flexible. And then, you know, what he did was he changed, he changed my perspective on everything. Like the way I think about life and, uh, and, and, and money and, uh, you know, people and time and stuff like that. Like he's just a huge inspiration to me. I feel like I was, you said like you have this drive, this go, go, go kind of mentality. And I, I really did. And I still do, but I, I feel like he gave me a lot of perspective on, um, on how short life is and how we really need to like care uh, and take care of each other and things like that. And just let stuff kind of roll off. I usually will, will kind of like, uh, I get worked up about a lot of things where now I try to just let them go a lot easier than I used to. Um, so I was work, but I'll tell you when you have a kid in the hospital and they're going through surgeries or you, you can't go in and see them or, um, you know, you're in the hospital all day. There's, there's nothing better to get your mind off of the horrible things that are going on in your life for me than working. I'm not the kind of guy who's going to like sit in a corner and sulk and just say, why me, why me, why me? So it was a, it, the company and continuing to grow, it allowed me to take my mind off of things. So I know there were people who are like, why are you answering uh, our emails or why are you on this call or why are you doing these things? Well, I need that. You know, I need that escape from this, this horrible reality that's happening right now. So I, I think, it, it, it allowed me to, to remotely run a company at that time because I was forced into it. And it allowed me to build systems and processes around myself to not have to be there and do all that work. So, um, and, you know, it allowed me to change my perspective and be who I am. So um, I'm, I'm a very faith-based person, um, you know, uh, and I really think that, you know, uh, James was put in my life for a reason. And he's a blessing to us and our family and we absolutely love him. And I wish he was here because I could hold him up, but he's at school. So he goes <laughs> to school now and he's two and a half and he's got one more heart surgery in about a year, a year and a half. Um, but you know, if you can take these challenges, so we all have something, right? Everybody thinks, Oh, Hey, these people grow their business so fast or they have all these things going or they, they had money or they, he had, he had a job and I don't have a job uh, or I don't have a job. And uh, you know, I need a job. Like, Figure out how to turn your challenge into fuel, I think. Like, how can you turn that into a positive? So everybody always tries to spin these things into negatives and say, why me? Well, um, you know, figure out how to turn it into a positive. Look on the, the bright side of things. And these obstacles are really um, challenges to you that were placed there um, for a reason that you're, you know, jumping through these hoops and going over these, uh, tackling these challenges head on. So, um, so, I don't know. That's kind of my story and everything that happened with James. I love it. What an inspiration you are. I, you're just amazing. So, I mean, you, huh. you're such a pillar of strength to your family, obviously. And also what an example you are to all the people you interact with in your work and in your business. And yeah, what a shining example you are to everybody. So thank you. And well, thanks thank for you. talking about it so openly. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. Like he is, uh, he's, I don't know. I, I want his story to be out there because he's a, uh, hopefully, I, I mean, there, you won't believe when you talk about these things. I, I you know, uh, I'll, I'll go to an event or I'll just talk to somebody and you never know when, I mean, one in a hundred kids have congenital heart defects. So one in a hundred people, one in a hundred kids. That's that are a lot. So everybody's been tough. Once you get into this world, you start realizing how small of a world it is. Uh, you know, it's like everybody knows somebody that's been affected by it or touched by it. So it's, um, it's very easy to think this isn't going to happen to me or, I, you know, I'm not involved in that, but um, we didn't know until we were sucked in. And now it's, you know, that's kind of like our family. We do a lot together. We go with these heart walks and things like that. And it's, it's really crazy how many people um, have been affected by it and touched by it. So uh, I think the more we talk about these things, like our challenges and struggles, the stronger we get. So don't be afraid of it. You know, don't, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I love it. Well, and I love that what you said, turn your challenge into fuel. That's um, a really great, great way to look at it and think about it instead of going in the corner and sulking, like you said, that, that it um, boosts you up and propel you forward to break through it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get back over more on real estate deals because I know people love to hear about their real stories of deals. Can you tell us about your best deal um, that you can remember and give us some more inspiration here? Yeah. Um, so I, we were talking before the show and I, I have a COO that has come in uh, about a year and a half ago and he runs the company day to day. So a lot of the deals, I get to see them, and, uh, but I don't celebrate them like we used to. So it's become more of a business and a job than it is. Like, I don't really love uh, going into the houses and making them look pretty. I'm an engineer. I really like numbers. So my favorite deal, and I think one of our best deals to date, was, um, was a house in, it was in Pensacola. It was, about, it was about a year, it was about two years ago. And um, I remember my, uh, my acquisitions rep calling me and saying, hey, I've got this house, here's the address. It's really nice. And this is the time where I, I think people were starting to coin this word wholesale, right? It was a wholesale deal that you're just putting on the MLS and, and selling it for retail, right? So um, you, you find it basically wholesale and sell it retail. So people use that term all the time still, but uh, maybe you're doing some work and cleaning it up or painting it. And so it's at that time, all we did to this house, this house was two years old. Um, it was worth about $170,000. And she called me up and said, hey, I'm at 95,000 and they want 100. I think I can get them at 95. What do you want to do? And I, I said, well, let me take a look at it real quick. I said, okay, how, how good of a shape is it? She said, it's two years old and I, you don't, we don't even need to clean it. It's in perfect condition. Two and years said, old? Did you say two years old? Two-year-old two house. It only, oh, my it's goodness. Years, it's been built two years before. Perfect okay. condition. Upgraded house. Granite countertops. Nice. And this is Pensacola, mind you. So $170,000 about like, this is prime median income type house. This is uh, under 200000 Go Go like crazy. Um, and I said, I said, if they want a hundred thousand dollars, you can buy it for a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. You don't need I'd it. say she, give them a hundred and one. Yeah. She's like, I can get them to a 95. I can get it. They were at, they were at one of five. I was at 90. I'm at 95. I can get them there. I said, I said, look, are they going to be happy at a hundred? They said, yeah. She said, yes. I said, fine. Um, that's, that's okay. Um, and so I said, well, selling, it's a two year old house. And so she said that they're building an apartment complex in the back in, behind the house and they hate it. They don't want to be in that construction area. They're a little bit older. Uh, they came here for quiet time, uh, just live there, retire there. And so they want to buy another house. So not only did we buy this house for a hundred thousand dollars, but they also used my realtor. So a realtor that was on my team at, at the time, uh, to go find them another house. So she made a commission with, uh, the company getting a, you know, myself getting a referral as the referring agent. Uh, cause I have a license too. So it was, it was, and, and then they bought the next house. We thought we'd have to close, keep them in there for a week and they buy the second house. Uh, but come to find out they had enough cash to buy the other house too. So it certainly wasn't about money. And, um, so we bought the house for a hundred thousand dollars. We closed on it, um, with our money. And then we turned around and listed it. We, we cleaned the carpets. Um, but we didn't even have to clean it. They cleaned it. They, it was like, it wasn't just broom swept. It was like, it was better than the professional cleaners that I have that come into our houses right now and clean after construction. Wow. Um, so we spent about $350, uh, cleaning all the carpets, like deep cleaning the carpets. And then we list on MLS, sold it in a day for, I think it was close to 170,000. So after, you know, fees and all that stuff, we probably made in the range of 50, 55,000 on it. So um, great deal. And we also made a commission on the sale. The seller was really happy with what they, you know, they just wanted to be out of there fast. What we found out after we listed it was there was a fence between the, the two houses and the next door neighbor had been really fighting with them for a long time since they moved in like two years before. So they didn't tell it. We didn't uncover that in the sales appointment, but I'm pretty sure that that was what was pushing them out of there a lot more than the apartment complex because they got really mad at us. We, we moved the fence and it had to do a little bit of that. Um, so uh, it was they, the day that we put the sign in there, they called us yelling at us. So, um, and at about, they thought it was the seller who was listing the house and they were yelling at, about them. So it's clearly a, a family feud going on. So that was, that, that's my recollection of, we didn't have to do anything. It's a great deal. Um, and so we do a lot of those now, wholesales where we're kind of just, We'll buy them, close on them, clean them out, and list them on the MLS to, uh, to make a little bit bigger profit margin. So, Those are like so nice and easy. If you can get them at big discounts, that's the ideal kind to get. Yeah, I mean, I got excited recently when um, 
or close. Well, we closed on one, but we have nasty tenants in there that we didn't know about. Mm. You know, the the truth of why someone sells you the house is sometimes revealed after the close, and he wouldn't let us um, give notice to the tenants during the escrow period. And now we come to find out that one of them has been um, in one of the family members is in jail for murder, and another one had set someone on fire. Like, hmm. No wonder the owner was afraid to talk to the tenants or collect the late rents or do let us be involved. Like, oh boy, fun stuff. But it'll all work out fine. We always eventually get everything out. So, <laughs> yeah, <And> you <laughs> gotta make out. sure that you, get, you know if you got all those question marks in those deals, uh, add a little bit in there for those. Oh yeah, it's time. it's a plenty good deal. I think all we're gonna do is, which this is light for Southern California. All we're gonna do is like uh, replace the flooring and paint it. You know, because it's a newer house too. Usually we're like moving walls and doing really heavy renovations mm -hmm. and permits and all that so yeah it'll be good well do you have a deal that you can remember if you've had any where it was a challenge or you learned lessons on or it didn't turn out the way you wanted it one of your not so great deals i do i have a uh, i have one that sticks out uh, uh it's a it's still a sore in my in my side so um you know, in Pensacola, we had this time where we started, um, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of a deal junkie. I really like to do deals. I, I, land, apartment complex, like bring me anything. I'm excited about it, right, in real estate yeah. now. And um, so I've recently, I've had to put my blinders on and just stay in our core focus and our core competency. But uh, uh, a few years ago, we were buying, um, so we're, we're flipping houses that were, you know, those uh, first, second time home buyer type houses in Pensacola, around 150, 200,000, uh, right around there. And, and then I just, we got a couple deals that were really big. They were these more expensive houses on the water and things like that. So seven, $800,000 ARVs. And, um, but the paydays looked a lot bigger, right? So it looked like there was going to be $150,000, $200,000 uh, payday on them. <laughs> Um, so you get really excited. You see, start seeing dollar signs. And so we bought a couple of those and we bought one that I can remember. So the, the, the family that we bought it from had won the lottery. They won $3 million in the lottery. They had a, uh, their house was right on the water, um, right on Pensacola Bay, beautiful house. They put about six, six hundred thousand dollars into it. Something like that. Like they renovated the whole thing, new floors, all the bathrooms were, I mean, they just wasted a ton of money on this. Uh, put in, put in a pool, put in LED lights all over the, I mean, just, it was crazy how much, uh, how much money they put in this house. And so I thought for sure that I could just buy it and do one of these wholesale type deals, buy it, clean it up, list it on the MLS and make a hundred thousand dollars. Um, so we got them down in price. We even had them carry the note. So they carried a, um, uh, the first on it. Uh, so they carried the, the note back, uh, did some seller financing. And then I brought in a second uh, lender. So I didn't have any money in the deal. Um, and um, we ended up uh, ha having to clean it up a little bit because it, when you get into these seven, $800,000 ARV houses, and you, and you know how you do some of these in California, these, um, these houses have to be right. Like they can't have all these imperfections in them, poorly constructed work. The little things that, that you, most people don't see, but somebody going to spend that kind of money um, is really going to look for. So I probably in your area, I think a couple million dollar ARV, right? So, um, so we, we ended up putting like $50,000 in this house, just cleaning it up, changing, like changing out some carpets, just, uh, doing work to get it ready, like ready to list at the number that we wanted to list it at. Um, this house also, there was a train track that was close by it. So the train in Pensacola runs down along the comps that I ran had, you know, we're sitting by that train track too. Um, it was also on a private road. There was a couple other things, kind of gotchas that we had, um, when we tried to sell it. So we put it, we listed it. We kept dropping the price. It just wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell, it wouldn't sell. Oh. And I'm, I'm at this point, um, my second is, is charging interest, but my first was, uh, interest free for six months. Okay. Well, six months, actually four months into it. So these people won the lottery. Remember they won the lottery. They spent all their money. And now they're trying to sell everything. They sold their cars, their boats, the house, everything moved into another house. And they, they held this note for about 500,000, five, 525. They held the note for 525 on the house. And um, then they called me up and said, hey, I'm going to sell this note to somebody for a discount. And I don't know what they're going to do with 
I don't know if they're going to renew it, you know, after six months or not. So, um, so I said, okay, what do you want to sell it to them for? And I said, I might want to buy it. So we kind of, I thought I knew I could get a discount on the note and I actually make some more money back. And uh, they told me the number they were going to, they were willing to give up like $75,000 in equity on this note to sell it. Um, so I didn't have the money, but I called up somebody I know that does. And I said, Hey, this is a great deal. Do you want to buy this note? Um, so they bought it at a, I think we were at a $60,000 discount on the note. And then uh, after six months, it started carrying interest at that point, right? So six months was interest free. He bought the note. At least then I could renew it. I held the house for about a year and um, I ended up losing, we ended up losing $70,000 on this house. Oh. <laughs> so, so we put in 50, my lenders, my lenders made $40,000 combined between the two of them, not, not including the discount note. So just interest for, to them. So we lo if, think about this. If you're, if you're investing in houses right now and you're using private lenders and you're working with them, this is how you do business properly. You lose $70,000, your lenders make 40. Okay. So we could, I could have called them up and said, Hey, would you take a discount on this note or, or Hey, we're losing money on it. Or, um, you know, a, a lot of different things, but they made $40,000. They invested with us again. Um, and so on paper, you might say, well, you know, they made 40, you lost 70. Why not talk to them and, and work it out? Well, you know, when you're running a business, the most important thing is you take care of the people that work with you. Right. So, um, so think about that when you're doing, um, you know, taking other people's money, taking, you know, have that fiduciary duty to them and, and how you're going to treat them because those people still invest with me today. If I call them up and I need something, they're, they're in deals with me on a regular basis. So, so we did all this work. We held the house for like a year, year and a half, um, lost $70,000 on it. But it, I think about it like a lesson. It was a lesson that I learned that we won't do again. So buying nice properties in Pensacola, the, the difference is your, your buyer pool is so small for a house like that. You know, um, you don't have the 10 showings on the first day. You got maybe two or three people that'll look at it over six months wow. um, that are in the market for something like that. It's not like other places, it's like the $35 million house in, in LA, right? Mm -hmm. um, you got a couple people that could buy something like that. Um, yeah. And they're going to be really picky. They can walk away from it because there's a train, the, the train track was a turnoff for some people. Um, I thought they would kind of like it. Like my kids would love this train going by it, mm -hmm. it. You couldn't hear it inside the house. It wasn't a noise issue. It wasn't anything like that. Um, and it had a beautiful dock right on the water. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that I learned and, um, there was a lot of other problems with that house too, but that was probably a deal that obviously I wish I hadn't done, but if I hadn't done it, who knows what other mistakes I would have made in my business. So it was a learning lesson. It's education. I treat everything that way. If we make money or lose money, um, you know, a lot of us have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to college and we don't use our degree. So this was a really good um, lesson learned for me. And it did cost me in the company 70,000 bucks. But, um, you know, it was also proof to my lenders that we'll take care of them in, in that time. Um, and if that's the only house that we did that year, I'd be in trouble, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, that month we had, you know, five, six, seven other deals that we were doing to be able to take that hit. And, uh, and honestly, I just wanted that cash back to go use on other deals. How much more money could we have made with that money? Um, so we had three houses that went in something like that. We had a $70,000 loss. We had a $50,000 loss. And we had a $10,000 gain on the three houses that were supposed to make me three, $400,000. Uh. So um, lesson learned. Too bad we had to le learn it like three times. Yeah. Well, thanks for your transparency. I've experienced similar things. You, you go in all excited. You think you're going to do great. I have one of those right now that we keep dropping the price on. I'm like, why are people not willing to pay 50 to 75 grand more for a fixed up house? And they keep buying the junk that's not fixed up. You know, my price is just a little higher than the not fixed up stuff. And it just shocks me. But Lesson learned. Don't do any more houses like that, Holly. You know, I'll learn it and then I won't do it again. And I can't echo you enough on taking care of your investors. When I um, borrow money from individuals, I don't tell them, hey, if it goes well, you're going to get all your money. And if it doesn't, I'm going to ask you to take less money. No, the deal is always they're going to get that percent interest. And I'm 100% guaranteeing that I guarantee all my notes personally. So um, yeah, take care of people and it will benefit you in the long run for sure so, absolutely yeah. um, i think like that honor and integrity and ownership of, of what you're doing is the most important thing period in this especially in this business like it's 
I don't, I think, uh, you know, a lot of real estate investors, um, I think that term, you know, we're trying to make the, the, that I'm around that I like to spend time with and, and network with and associate myself with are people that are making sure that we are um, not looked on poorly, like uh, maybe real estate investors of the past of uh, slum lords, uh, you know, flippers that cut corners and rip people off and stuff like that. So, you know, really uh, making sure that you're, you're responsible with uh, other people's money with, um, you know, even your staff, you know, their time, their energy, their effort and uh, stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's important to me and I know it is to you too. So. Um, yeah, thank you for emphasizing that point. Well, I'd love um, to hear about what your business looks like today and share with us, you know, your kind of your business plan and goals for the year of how many flips versus how many wholesales, how big is your staff, um, what the structure of your company, if you would share that before we wrap up here. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, um, I'd have to probably go counter everybody. And we've had a little bit of turnover recently, which is pretty common. We're growing, we're scaling our business and um, we're really pushing. Like I'm, you, you probably, like you said, I'm, I'm really driven. And so is my COO, Nate. He's, he's phenomenal. Um, and we want to hit these big numbers and we want to push people to their limits and we want to see how much we can do. And we want people on the team that can drive in that direction too, that have this kind of, uh, um, uh, Personal and professional growth and development is one of our core values in the company. And I want people to all just never have a ceiling and want to do better. So we have about, um, uh, I'd say we have 15 people in the company. So the way it looks is, is me as the owner. Um, I have a COO and he runs the day-to-day -day operations of the company in all facets. Um, and then we have uh, a couple, we have basically three different departments. Um, so we have, uh, we have sales. Um, which is basically inside and outside. So we have a lead team that answers the phones. We get a lot of inbound calls. We get about 200 inbound calls a week. And so uh, we have two ladies on the phone that answer the calls. Um, we have a sales rep that goes on the appointments at the houses uh, every day um, in each city. So we have three sales reps in Nashville, Pensacola, and Chattanooga. Um, and we have a, a dispositions person. So somebody that actually uh, moves the properties on the back end uh, for our wholesale deals. So if we're selling a contract, then they're, uh, they're moving it and uh, having investors go through. Um, and I think that, and then a sales manager that runs that department. And then we have the operation side, which is basically our transaction coordination, um, lending coordinator, um, finance, that kind of stuff. Um, we have a outsourced bookkeeper. We have a outsourced kind of uh, quote unquote CFO who does, uh, we're implementing Profit First right now, which was a great uh, book by Michael Malkowitz. Um, I don't know if you, you've read it, Holly, but it's fantastic. I have. Yeah. Cash flow. So in a business like ours where we do, you know, a couple million dollars in profit per year, really trying to figure out how to cash flow that business and keep it accountable. It's, uh, it was key for us. So we brought her on a couple months ago to do that with us. And then um, uh, let's see, we have a, uh, we have a social media uh, manager. She does, uh, you know, 15, 20 hours a week, just uh, making live video walkthroughs and things like that for our investors and our uh, Facebook page and Instagram page. And then we have, um, let's see, uh, we have a, a flipping manager, a guy, who, a project manager for all the flips. So he runs all the actual flips where we're swinging hammers and stuff like that. And he and I actually do a profit split on that. Uh, those deals. So he's a flipper and a, a realtor down in uh, Florida, great guy. So we're almost like partners on those deals with his company and mine. Um, and then we have a realtor on the team that lists all of our stuff um, that works for us uh, directly. And I think that's it. <laughs> As a big team. Okay. And I have the question that popped into mind. When sure. people want to follow you on social media, where, what is your, um, you're, I'm sure you have a business Facebook yeah. page and an Instagram handle. Yeah, our business. It's funny because it's, oh, we ha, I forgot we have a we hired a chief marketing officer too, like a CMO. So she runs all of our key performance indicators and marketing uh, outbound, um, some Facebook ads and stuff for us, all of our social media now. So I remember that because I have no idea what our Instagram is um, <laughs> because she set it up and started doing it. So um, hopefully you can find that from our Facebook page. But our Facebook page is, is Blackjack Real Estate, and I think it's. Um, facebook.com slash blackjack estate e-s-t-a-t-e -E. so blackjack real estate was owned by some guy uh I don't know, some guy in germany or something i still can't get it 
Darn. Um, <laughs> yeah, if anybody can help me with it. It's actually, I wanted Blackjack RE because that's our, that's our website, blackjackre.com. So, um, right. so yeah, that's what the team looks like. And we're, we're, hi- we're bringing on new people. We're doing new things all the time. Um, right now we're hiring for three positions. Um, we need an assistant to our transaction coordinator. She's slammed. Um, we need another lead manager uh, to answer the phones, another lead intake person. Um, and we need, uh, we're trying to hire our sales, sales manager is also our sales rep in Nashville. So we're trying to hire a sales rep in Nashville so he can elevate himself to manage all those people. So um, it's a constant, uh, the people are the most important thing. The people in our company, that's the system and the process. That's the number one thing, like all these other things that we do. Uh, but having the right people and, you know, leading them and managing them is the most important thing. So, Awesome. And how many deals do you hope or plan to do this year? Um, I don't know. I, I, we're, we, we've landed, it's funny because the last two years we, we had a goal to do a certain number of deals and, and a certain amount of money, like that equaled a certain amount of gross profit. And that's really kind of the numbers that we focused on. And what I, what I found was um, two years ago, we did 185 deals and we did like 1.3 million in pro- gross profit before expenses. And then the next year we did 187 deals or 189 and we did, uh, what did we do? 2.35 uh, or something. So we did, did like an extra million dollars in profit on the same transactions. So that was my focus this year is how do we get more efficient and then also, how do we look at the, just how do we get that bottom line number, that, that net, how do we get that up? Um, so I think we'll probably land somewhere around 200 this year, but our goal was to do three and a half million um, in uh, profit prior to expenses. So, um, and that's not including cost of goods. And it's hard, you know, when you talk about real estate, we'll probably do like 25 million in, in real estate transactions total. So um, some, that's, that's kind of the goal is, we, and we go quarter by quarter. We try to hit these numbers, but we break it down into quarters. And uh, we, we operate off of the EOS model from Traction. Uh, it's a book by Gino Wickman. Fantastic book if you haven't read it. But um, that, that book has, is how we uh, put the team in place, how we run our weekly meetings, how we uh, look at our quarters and break them down. So uh, we'll probably land somewhere around 200 deals. We do somewhere between like 15 and 20 deals a month. And, um, but I really want to focus on that number because I know how much it costs us to a deal for marketing and I know how much it costs us to do a deal operationally in my company too and it's really expensive to do an operational deal including like all the staff hours all the marketing costs all the overhead and when you get to that number I got to make that or more for the deal to make sense you know if we're doing five thousand dollar deals now uh, if we make five thousand dollar profit the company technically loses money on a deal like that I'm not saying I'm gonna turn it down but like knowing those kind of numbers makes us figure out how we how we can do more with less. So I don't know. I right. sound like the, the U.S. government that I've worked for for so long, right? Um, <laughs> the military's always been trying to do more with less. Um, but, you know, really, and, and without, also without hurting kind of the morale and everything that we do inside the company. So still trying to make it fun for them. So, so how many of those deals will be flips this year? Do you uh, well, prob- prob- probably 25 to 30. We try to do two a month. So okay. that's, that's the goal. If we can, if we can sell two houses a month, um, buy and sell two houses a month, that's a good, that's a good number for us. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, and listeners, um, Bill is graciously going to share with us, um, some of the top books from his 2018 book list. He is, he was sharing with me that he tries to read 50 books a year to right. improve his business and himself, which is super impressive. I have to ask, is that reading with eyes or listening on audiobook? Which is it? Uh, both. So I like to do both. Since I drive down to Pensacola or fly down to Pensacola, um, um, I usually will, will do audible books on the way. So I can usually get a book each way. So yeah. sometimes uh, I really like audible, but I, I like to take notes and it's really hard for me to take notes. Um, so I don't mind audible if I'm sitting in a place where I can either take notes on my phone or write down notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I... So the way that I do it now and my technique is, uh, and I have my bookshelf over here, so I'll, I'll get the book on Audible or I'll read it on a Kindle or something like that. Um, and then if I really love it, I'll buy it. Yes. So I always want to have a hard copy and then I'll buy one. And, I, and what I do with my team is every quarter I'll, I'll buy um, books for specific people and uh-huh. give them to them. So, um, Brilliant. So, 
if you're really into books, I would say if you're buying a book, you should abs at least buy it for someone else, if not more than one copy and send it to some people. So uh, I like to do that. Um, if I'm buying it and I'm usually buying two or more and I'm sending them to some other people and they'll just get a book to show up. So if I ask you for your address, it's probably because you're getting a book. <laughs> on, so. um, but yeah, uh, Audible has been key for me being able to hit those kind of numbers. Without that, I, I'd, I'd be really bored driving six hours down to Florida. So. I love it. And I'll listen to the same book over and over, especially um, the one that I've probably heard four times and still haven't absorbed and certainly haven't implemented because it's so full. It's never split the difference. Chris Voss, I'm sure you've read it and taken a bunch of notes, but there's so much in there. It's like, I would need to just like maybe do a chapter a week and then try and implement things from that. I mean, some books have so much amazing content that you can't possibly just hear it or read it once and get everything you can out of it. So That's right. And if you just heard those two words that I said, that's right. That's a big thing from Chris Voss's book, right? Yes. So it's funny that you say that because I just, uh, so I just listened to that for the fifth time. Uh, okay. I'm not the alone time. then. Okay. I'm like, what no. is wrong with me? Why do I have to hear it so many times? Oh, when I, I drove uh, from Pensacola to, back to Nashville this last time, uh, last week, I listened to his book on the way home. And, um, and it's funny because, um, so I, I, bought a, I bought a Tesla this year. It has autopilot on it. So um, while I was driving home in the car and I was stopping, at, you know, to charge on the way, I have to stop twice on the way to charge. And so I've got my notes up just typing in notes. So it's funny that you say that because if I open my notes page right now, it would be a you know, a couple pages of notes from the fifth time listening to that book by, uh, by Chris. It's, it's, it's incredible. That's a great one. And Extreme Ownership is another one that, uh, by Jocko Willink that I have been really uh, digging into. I've listened to a bunch of times and, and read and have sent to a lot of people. My whole company, uh, we actually added that as one of our core values of uh, ownership, extreme ownership in, into the company. Um, I haven't heard of that one, so I've oh, heard it's, of that one. That'll be it's nice fantastic. For me. It's fantastic. And if you're coming to uh, to the event in October that we have, um, I might have a surprise for you. So. Oh, uh, cool. Yes, I come every year. Love that event. Justin Williams, House Flipping. What is it? House Flip Hacking Live. Flip, Flip Hacking Live. Live. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say House Flipping exactly. Formula. That's the name of his course. Yeah, he's awesome. Yep. Okay, yeah, so... Cool. All of that was to say that Bill is giving us his book list um, or the top books for 2018. So that's our free download. So go to hardhatholly.com forward slash 124 to get that. Or you can text to the number 38470. So whip out your phone and dial in a new text to 38470. You're going to text hard hat with no spaces last time 38470. And we'll send you back this download and you'll be notified once a week when we have new podcasts via text if you want to be on that reminder service. So thank you so much. You can tell that these books have made huge impact for Bill and how he runs his business and his life and influences and inspires others. So definitely worth getting that download. So Bill, how do people um, find out more about you if they want to follow you? You gave us um, some hints on the Facebook business page, and I think you mentioned your website, but go ahead and tell it again. Yeah, sure. Um, so Facebook, we're uh, Blackjack Real Estate. So uh, facebook.com slash blackjack, blackjack estate. And then um, um, on our website, blackjackre.com, you can reach out to us um, I, and someone from my staff or, or I'll get the message. Um, and I tell you what, uh, Okay. I have, also have an executive assistant, so I'll give you her email. You can email her if you want to get a hold of me. So it's, her name's Nicole. It's Nicole at blackjackre.com. So if you email her, um, and it's funny, uh, if you send her your address, maybe you'll get a book. So we'll see. Ooh, <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much. I would love if you would share just, um, as we close out the show, your parting words of advice to people who are either thinking about getting into real estate investing or, have tried and haven't had great success. So what would you say to them to get them to keep on going? So I think the biggest thing is um, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about getting into it, just go. Like taking action and, um, is, is, is the biggest thing. If you fail, it's okay. Get up, dust yourself off and, and, and go again. Like I failed. We, I, I continuously fail. I fail constantly. I'm failing right now. We're screwing things up. We're making mistakes. So, um, and then if you're, if you're in there and, and, um, you know, it's, it's not working for you. Like I, I always think back to this, you know, everybody's just kind of like 
two inches from gold, right? It's right there in front of us and, and uh, most people will quit. So uh, a five second story, it took me, I started this business, it took me four months to get a deal and, and about four and a half months to put money in the bank. So if I quit after month three, we wouldn't be talking right now. If I quit after month two, month one, month four even, it was a struggle. I knew that. I set aside some money, I put together a plan, and I executed on the plan, and I didn't quit. So, um, and, and the last thing is, you know, take, take everything in your life. What are you good at? What are things that, um, that you're, like your superpower? What's your superpower? This is a great uh, time for that, right, with uh, these huge Marvel movies. Like, what are you really good at? Take that and go use it. So, and build your business around that. I build my business around what I'm really good at and what I'm, and, and then outsource what I'm bad at or things that I'm not so good at. So um, just think about that. Use your, use your skills and, and all these struggles and problems and challenges and everything in your life to an advantage, not a disadvantage. So um, I don't know. With all those things, just go out there and take action. That's the number one thing that gets, gets people going. Like just go knock on a door, make a phone call, um, invite a real estate investor out to lunch or something. Yes. Yeah. And if they're not too successful, they might go with you. The really successful ones might be like, mm. or when they're way up at a higher level like you, then they're like, they want to give back. So yeah, don't be offended if some real estate investor says, no, I'm too busy. Um, find someone else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and that's a point where if you're there, you got to start doing that too. You got to start learning how to say no. All I did was say yes, yes, yes. And I, once I learned how to say no, um, I know I, I'm, I'm a lot more effective. I get a lot more done. And, yeah. um, it's, so if you're in that place, you're like right there and ready to explode, maybe say no to that lunch and go work on your business. You know? <laughs> yeah. Good point. Well, thanks so much, Bill, for joining us. You've been awesome. And listeners go check out, um, the resources that he's given us today and get out there, take action and we'll catch you on the next show. Thanks for listening. Hey there. Thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like it and click subscribe to get notified of more videos. And you can go to hardhatholly.com for a free download on secrets to finding great deals.